There we go. Over to you, Tim. Great. Hello, uh, my name is Tim, and I'm the curator at St. Bart's Church uh, in Liverpool. I'm, um, I'm with Grace. Hello. And we're going to be uh, interviewing uh, Pete Hughes, who is the lead pastor of KXC Church in London. Hi, Pete. How are you? Yeah, all good. Doing good, thank you. Great to be with you all. And ha- how's London? London? London's good. We've had some good weather. I mean, I've, I've just been on Google Images to, to look at a picture of your church. Oh yeah, and, I mean that is glorious weather. So That's I'm guessing it's always that weather. Yeah. Which is, <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to get in the vibe of, of your church community <laughs> and imagine myself walking into the building. So yeah, but no, things in London all good. <laughs> Amazing. Well, virtually welcome. Do you want to tell us Thank a little you. bit about yourself? Yeah. So my wife and I, we lead a church, an Anglican church in central London. Um, in King's Cross, so you might know King's Cross as the um, the big train station. So we we meet just sort of down by the train station, and we live about five ten minutes from there, um, up very close to the Arsenal Stadium. So some people will immediately switch off even at just the mention. Um, but we're we're based there. Um, we have three kids, so we're in the midst of homeschooling. So stress levels have been fairly high three different curriculum and trying to juggle church, family life and all of that. Um, And yeah, grew up just outside London, a place called High Wycombe, um, and then spent a lot of time as a teenager in Birmingham. So I kind of count myself a Brummie, Um, don't really have the accent, but but I am a Brummie at heart. Um, Studied um, Nottingham, I studied maths and philosophy actually, so a bit of a nerd underneath it all. And then bit of a journey. I never thought I'd end up in church work. My dad was a vicar. And as a kid, it was like, I don't know what I do, but I know what I won't do. And I will never work for the church. <laughs> um, and it just so happened that I ended up working um, for the church. And that led me eventually towards church planting. And we've been leading this church in London for about 10 years. Amazing. Brilliant. Brilliant. You talked a little bit about... Um, homeschooling with your kids and yeah. how that's been just um tell us how lock being on a whole has been for you as a family all the different aspects of that and has god been yeah. speaking to you about anything particularly during this time yeah i mean it's a roller coaster and i'm hoping i'm not alone in that that we've all <laughs> experienced highs and serious lows probably the lows have been more dominant at times um There's been some beautiful moments in terms of like a lot of time with kids and, you know, the homeschooling bit is is stressful, but then family time that that's felt really precious. Um, And then again, there's some amazing moments like church online. It's not the same. Um, And we can celebrate all the positives because there have been some real positives, but we also need to recognize that the kind of loss of not being in a room together, that's kind of been hard. But again, you know, every so often you just see God at work in people's lives, in community. You're like, wow, God really is at work in some incredible ways. So there's moments I feel really encouraged by what's happening in lockdown. And then there's moments where personally you realize that the best and the worst of us, you know, emerges in moments like this. So I've kind of, the language I've been using is, is lockdown feels like, like an imposed desert experience and and the point of a wilderness or a desert experience is it is a kind of purifying moment you kind of all the stuff that you've been busy sort of ignoring or trying to find distractions for um during the rest of your time suddenly when there's a bit of stillness i.e in lockdown you realize all that stuff rises to the surface mm-hmm. and you get a clearer picture of how you're really doing in the state of your own soul and inner being and that's beautiful in moments and really not beautiful in other moments as you realize gosh I'm incredibly selfish and I'm impatient um, and I get really frustrated very easily Um, and I think I think moments like that whilst terrifying at times they're also an invitation into encounters with God and and therefore these experiences are deeply formative 
Like we will all come out of lockdown, different people. Um, and what people we come out is really, you know, what, what we do with these moments where we're confronted with our own inner self. And if we bring that stuff into the presence of God, which can feel like a dogfight, but when we do that, we experience grace, we find a greater measure of healing. And when we don't, when we choose to watch just that one more episode of you know, on Netflix, that extra tub of ice cream or whatever it is, when we choose to self-medicate, we know that we end up sort of like further away from God's grace. So what I've been trying to do is, is as I've been confronted with my own mess, trying to bring it to God. And on good days, you know, just really sensing his presence and sense I'm becoming more like him. And on my less good days, you know, Netflix and a tub of ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And you talked a little bit about church online there. How's, how's that going for you at KXC? And um, have, you, have you had any like um, stories of things that have been happening that God's been doing through them? Yeah. Like we've seen like a, a real surge. So we're, we're in the centre of London. So, you know, demographically, it's, it's a really young, young congregation. We're praying in older folk, kind of spiritual parents and grandparents you know, we don't have lots of those. So that's our big prayer. Lord, would you send us some people that can be spiritual godparents, grandparents to our folk. Um, but in that demographic, and there's some research that's recently come out about this, there's an incredible spiritual hunger. So I think it was roughly sort of 6% of the UK adult population would regularly attend church pre-lockdown. Now, in lockdown, stats suggest that around 25% have attended an online service. In the 18 to 35 demographic, that's at 34 mm. percent. So there's an incredible spiritual hunger. More Bibles have been purchased in lockdown than in any other period in recent years. In terms of websites like 24 seven prayer, they've been absolutely bombarded as people are questioning, like, how do I pray? How do I connect with God? So we are seeing that we're seeing an incredible spiritual hunger, more people tuning into church. It's never been easier to sneak into the back of a church building and sit on the back row. You literally in your pajamas with a cup of coffee, open up the laptop and there you are. Nobody needs no. And therefore, I think we are seeing an incredible level of engagement. And that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, but none of us really know what's next. You know, when we come out of lockdown, will those you know people still engage? Can we draw them into, you know, practices of discipleship? But it is, it's really encouraging. So, you know, I think church online, I personally, nothing beats being in a room together, worshipping God, um, opening up the scriptures, creating space for prayer and ministry. I mean, nothing beats that. And yet I think we do have to celebrate that for many people, this has been an incredible opportunity to explore faith and explore church without some of the barriers of walking into a building and worrying, am I going to fit in? A lot of those barriers have just come crashing down and now people can, you know, check out church. And I think a lot of people are doing so. Mm. Mm. That's great. Yeah. And how do you think like people who are regularly attending church or maybe are quite new to church could maybe like use this time as an opportunity to sort of like get into new habits, new practices, new yeah. disciplines? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is an incredible moment for spiritual formation. And by that, I mean trying to find new practices. Like when we went into lockdown, you know, for those of us that, you know, have been working from home, we've tried to find new rhythms of working. You know, in, in London, everyone has their exercise routines. Um, and it's like, okay, I need to find a new, you know, way of keeping fit and staying healthy. A lot of people are talking about screen time, trying to limit screen time. You know, so you realize in a moment like this, everyone is actually trying to find practices that enhance well-being. Now, we in the church have been doing practices for 2000 years. You know, so we actually have a huge contribution, you know, into society right now. So look, there's some tried and tested practices that will help you live life well and enable you to draw close to God. So we kind of quite early on in lockdown tried to encourage people to develop a rule of life, which sounds super scary if you've not heard of that before. 
but it's basically some simple practices that you do each day that are going to help you be with Jesus, become like Jesus and do the stuff that Jesus did. So we've got this website called Pattern, which is about patterns of living. And if you go on the website, you can sort of like begin to sort of like fill in some details of different practices you want to develop. So we've got some really simple ones as a church. One is about reading scripture. So trying to read through the Bible, what the New Testament in a year, we're doing that as a community. And it's a really simple um, tool we're using. It's called Bread. Um, so Bread is like an acronym. The B means be still. So we encourage people first thing in the morning before you check your kind of social media and the news feed and get depressed. So before the depression kicks in, um, be still. Just a moment of just like, yeah, being in the presence of God, slowing your breathing down. Then R, read a small passage from the New Testament. Um, e is encounter Jesus in the text. So we encourage people find one verse and then just chew on that one verse. What comes to mind? What excites you? What intrigues you? You know, where do you find yourself curious? Um, because this is kind of an ancient practice called Lectio Divina, but it's this idea that in that curiosity, you might encounter God himself. So that's E, encounter. A is apply it to your life. In other words, how are you going to go about today differently because of that one thing that you've just, you know, been chewing on? And then D, devote the day to God. Now, we reckon that's 10 minutes of your time maybe 15 but if everyone was starting the day with a bit of bread um then we think actually it's gonna tee us up to do the day with jesus so that's one discipline we have another discipline where we're trying to encourage people to pray we're trying to use these simple acronyms where people can remember um to pray p-r-a-y p is praise just starting the day what am i thankful for r repent which isn't just about saying sorry, because it's the beginning of the day. So hopefully people haven't messed up too badly by then. <laughs> but it's the idea, like the word repentance means to turn around or to turn towards. So it, it, under the lid, what's the stuff going on that you want to turn towards Jesus? So if you wake up and you're aware of like anxiety or a sense of dread about the day or just feeling low, how can you bring those emotions into the presence of Jesus? That's what we mean by repentance, as well as confession of sin. So R is repent. A, ask. What do you want to ask God about? And then why is yield where we stop? And having done a lot of speaking, we're like, God, is there anything you want to say? So that's kind of, we encourage people to read the Bible and pray. And then other simple disciplines of like staying healthy with fitness and screen time I've mentioned. And how do we love our neighbours? So we're trying to encourage people to get into a practice of checking in on their neighbours. Now, In London, people are really bad at this. A lot of people don't even know the names of people who live next door to them. Um, and we're trying to say, look, as the church, we've got to do better, right? So let's get to know our neighbours and let's love our neighbours. And if we need you know, some practices that help us do that better, then brilliant. Let, let's, let's do that. So these are very simple practices that we're trying to say to our church. If we develop some very simple rules of life, we think we might come out of lockdown more in love with Jesus, more in love with our community and better equipped to serve God's purposes in the world. So those are some of the things we're trying to encourage people to do as kind of essentially becoming more Christ-like in this moment of formation we're all being formed we're all going to come out as i said different but what if we in the church come out more like jesus we think that's good news for the world yeah amazing i think what what's interesting about the way the way you're phrasing it is it, it sounds like you've almost looked at this moment as, a, as an opportunity rather than yeah I think it's easy for us to look at this moment as, as a, a bit of a negative time but it sounds like you've yeah. seen them as an opportunity is that fair yeah i think that's entirely right i think it's it's brutally difficult and at the same time it's a real invitation in spiritual formation and you know going back to that kind of understanding of the desert a wilderness experience the whole point of a wilderness experience is it is unpleasant it's harsh terrain you know it's arid um but in that desert experience there is there is a stripping back and i i think we're in a moment that is more than just about personal spiritual formation. I think this is a moment of real potential cult 
spiritual formation and in the church i think potentially like reformation like mm. if, if you go back to the kind of middle ages and and the reformation that kind of swept through you know europe there's a couple of big things that took place one there was a power shift from the institution you know into the hands of the people and we've been saying to our community like that's happening right now like you are essentially the pastor to your street like people can't come and visit the church buildings your homes are becoming places of worship places of spiritual formation places of prayer like that shift is a very very significant shift um and then the second thing that happened in the reformation is that essentially because of the printing press the discovery of the printing press people suddenly read the scriptures in their own homes and again it was this huge shift to actually we're going to read the scripture in community in our homes um and i just wonder if something similar is happening right now we're reclaiming the home as a place of worship a place of prayer a place of mission a place of devouring scripture the, the idea of i go to church once a week just for kind of a moment or an experience that that's shifting and and yeah we're mourning some of the things that we're missing a lot but i think we have to recognize for the church this could be a very significant shift and at least in my own prayers i'm saying lord would you use something that's horrific would you work it for good and use it to breathe fresh life into the church and therefore into the world may this be like a, a mini reformation that happens that's what i'm praying for that's really cool Love that. Um, just just to take a few, like a few steps back, almost um, we loved reading about um, KXC Church and how that kind of came came to be. Could you just share yeah. some of the story about how how that started and um, some of the yeah. things that happened as well, the miracles that happened along the way? Yeah, so we we started. We just celebrated our ten year birthday before going to lockdown. So we just snuck it in just before COVID nineteen fully kicked in in terms of the lockdown uh, part of it. But we started 10 years ago. Um, the area behind King's Cross um, was basically wasteland. Like the reputation of King's Cross, you know, historically is hugely deprived part of London. The red light district of the area, gang activity, you know, significant deprivation and poverty. And then there was this plan of like, let's regenerate the wasteland behind the station. And quite literally, billions of pounds were, were going to be pumped in. And the likes of Google moving their headquarters to King's Cross. Facebook moved their headquarters. Big businesses. Which means that what's happened is you've got significant poverty and deprivation um, and this influx of incredible wealth. Um, so we went to the bishop at the time and said, look, rather than waiting 10 years, um, and then thinking, right, wouldn't it be amazing to have a church in the midst of, of King's Cross? What if we plant at the beginning of this journey and then we could be part of the unfolding story of King's Cross as, as an area? And we could actually build some bridges. Like the way the world works is you're going to have this huge influx of wealth and you're going to have significant deprivation and the wealth isn't going to flow to, uh, you know, restore some of the, the community work here. But, but the church could be an amazing bridge and could actually build some partnerships. So we said to the bishop, why don't we plan? And he said, go for it. The only thing is there isn't a building. There's no money because this was back in 2008, 2009, which was the global financial crisis. So we can't really give you anything, but if you're willing to take a risk, you have my blessing and permission. So we thought, well, let's just go for it. So we we rented a United Reform Church on Sundays. We our office was the spare room in our flat, and we only had one child at the time. And we began a journey. We had a simple vision, which was to actually give ourselves away to God, each other, and the people of King's Cross. We wanted to be wholehearted um, in worship, giving the best of our time, energy, affections to God in worship, to each other in community. Because as I've said, is, you know, London, it's hard to do community well because the pace of life is so intense that people work hard and then they get home, they eat, they unwind and watch some TV and then they go to bed. 
and they get up the next day and they go at it again. And there's not much margin for community. And we said, look, we as the church, we should be countercultural. We're going to prioritize hospitality, getting to know people, drawing people into family. So we want it to be reckless, wholehearted in our pursuit of community and then wholehearted in our pursuit of mission. We wanted to find out, you know, what are the drivers of poverty in King's Cross and how can we partner with others to see some of those cycles of poverty broken so that the life of the kingdom can flow to where it's needed. Um, so that was the vision 10 years ago, and we've been pursuing that over the last 10 years. And there's been highs and there's been lows. And, and honestly, it's a story of God just being faithful to his promises. Like when we started, there was a wave of, I guess I would describe it as miraculous provision. We were given an anonymous gift of 50,000 pounds week one. Um, this was, we had no money. Um, it was in the, as I said, the financial crisis. And we, we were bricking it thinking we're not even going to be able to rent anywhere. Um, how are we going to afford this? And a gift like that for me was one of the signs of God saying, look, this isn't your idea and it's not your church. It's my church. And I always back my vision, you know, so that was a beautiful moment. We, we ended up being given um, rent free office space for a few years. And we just experienced these moments of it felt like divine provision of God saying, look, I will provide for your needs. And, and we've been over the last 10 years trying to do the same things, the really simple things, trying to love God with everything that we have, trying to love each other, which we all know can be really difficult. Um, and we're trying to love King's Cross. You know, we want to fall in love with King's Cross because we believe God's heart for this area is he's got a huge heart for it. And we want to get in alignment with his heart and see his kingdom break out in King's Cross. So that's kind of some of our story and, and some of our vision. Um, so you've, you've wrote yeah. a book recently, yeah. um, All Things New. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about the book and just explain a little bit what it's about? Yeah. So it, it, I actually started writing it about a decade ago, and it, it took that long to write, partly because we were church planting, you know, we, our family was growing, so I was trying to snatch time here and there to write it. But it, it came out of a conviction that a younger generation don't really know the story of God. So they either haven't grown up in environments where they knew the overarching story. So they might know certain verses. Um, but in terms of what the story is really all about, for a lot of people, they just don't know the story. And there's certain stereotypes that exist outside the church and inside the church that aren't actually true of the story of God. So one, one example would be the end of scripture. Like we've probably all heard the stereotype that the end of the story is that we die, we leave our bodies behind, our souls descend to some sort of disembodied bliss where we drink Red Bull, we ride around on clouds, we play harps and we sing Here I Am to Worship, the song my brother wrote. Um, so that, that's the kind of stereotype, and Tim would be, you know, chuffed to bits if that was the, the story. Um, but a lot of us either grew up with that story, or that's what people think. You die and your soul goes to heaven for all eternity. Um, that isn't actually how the story ends. Um, the way the Bible ends isn't us ascending to some sort of disembodied bliss. Actually, God comes down. That's how the story ends. And as God comes down, all of created order begins to experience healing. So John, who writes the book of Revelation, he sees this vision of God, you know, coming to earth and all things being reconciled to him. He says, look, suddenly there's no death. Death's gone. There's no grief. There's no crying. There's no pain. The former things, in other words, all of the pain, all of the mess, all of the sin, all of that's washed away. And then you have this vision of God sitting down on his throne. And he says, behold, I'm making all things new. Now, in the Greek language that the New Testament, second half of the Bible, was written in, there's two words for new. There's neos, which means brand new, and there's kainos, which is something old that's made new. It's restored to its former glory. It's like when you get an old car, you do it up, and it drives like new. Um, and when God sits down on his throne, he says, behold, I'm making all things kainos. In other words, this world that I created and I love that has been torn apart through sin and violence and injustice, 
I'm going to restore everything to how it was in the beginning in the in the Garden of Eden, where there was no sin, no sickness, no suffering, humanity fully alive in relationship with God, in relationship with one another and in relationship with all created order. I'm going to restore things to how they were back then. Um, and I grew up and I didn't know that story. And I suddenly realized, oh, my goodness, the, the end of the story is glorious. It's, it's way better than drinking Red Bull and riding around on clouds. Like it definitely <laughs> trumps that story. And if that's the end of our story, um, this one Catholic writer, Thomas Merton, says our lives are shaped by the end we live for. So we're, we're all living according to what we're heading towards. Now, if we believe that we're heading towards God renewing and redeeming every part of creation, then our task is actually to live in the light of that trajectory, which means in our local communities and, you know, how we treat our neighbours through to how we go about our careers, it all matters. God wants to renew every part of Liverpool and every part of London, and he wants to renew the fashion industry and education. He wants to redeem politics. He wants to redeem the arts. You know, God wants to renew and redeem all things. Um, and that's our story. And I think for a lot of people that I encountered, particularly a younger demographic, they didn't know that. Um, they, they were completely disinterested with the story that they had heard. And I felt like what I wanted to do is say, look, I don't think you've heard the full story. So can I tell you the full story? And as we began to preach that at KXC, we found that there was a younger crowd almost enchanted again with like, what? that's the story. That's an amazing story. It trumps the secular story. It trumps every other story. So there's a phrase I use again and again in the book, which is the story you live in is the story you live out. Um, and my hope is that as people immerse themselves in the biblical narrative, that they become so shaped by that story, they become agents of renewal all around them. So that, you know, we become agents of healing in Liverpool and King's Cross. Um, and we push this story towards, you know, the fulfillment of when Christ returns and everything's redeemed and restored. So that's essentially, you don't even need to read it now. I've just told you it. That, that is the book. <laughs> <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> you don't want to say that. If, if you wait a year, it will be in some sort of bargain bucket of a Christian bookshop. So that, that, that's the other way. Well, that's why I got either, in either... <laughs> <laughs> It's already there. That's what I'm saying. It's only, it's only just been out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Oh, yeah, that, that's brilliant. Be, being a midwife, one of the bits of, in the book that stood out to me was you, um, you tell the story about your wife give him yeah. birth and he had that amazing sort of immediate answer to prayer there and um you go on after that to talk about how we're made in the image of God and I wondered if you could just unpack a little bit about what that means to us today and now yeah so yeah so that's the language that you know at the very beginning of the story Genesis 1 and 2 you know it says we're made in the image and likeness of God and it's very familiar language to a lot of us, but it's kind of very loaded language that's, you know, we sometimes miss the meaning. So there's two words, image likeness, and those two Hebrew words at the beginning, they're only used again side by side in one other place in scripture. And that's in Genesis 5, where it says Adam had a son, Seth, in his image and likeness. Same two exact words. So in other words, what Seth was to Adam, we are to God. So, so if you've had kids and you've had that moment when you first hold your child and it's just like, oh my goodness, we've not met, but I love you. You're amazing. And then you begin to spot features. That's me, you know, and it's this incredible bonding moment as well as terrifying moment. I remember leaving the hospital thinking, should we be taking our baby home? We don't know what we're doing. Like, this isn't safe. So it's kind of this overwhelming experience. But, but that image and likeness language suggests that we are children of God um, and and when we really begin to understand that that begins to affect kind of how we see ourselves how we see other people you know that they're made in the image and likeness of God so if I'm a son and she's a daughter that means we're brother and sister 
So how we treat one another is like of deep significance in our story. So there's that part of, of the understanding of, of this kind of like image and likeness. But another understanding in, in the ancient world, an image of a God would have meant a statue of a God. So in, in the ancient world, and this is like thousands of years ago, every God would have a temple, a place where they would be worshipped. And inside every temple, there would be a statue of the God. And that, you know, is the place where you'd bow down and, and worship. But in the the biblical story and in the story of israel israel has a temple but inside that temple there's no statue and you, we know the ten commandments you shall not make an idol or a statue um so there's this kind of deep mystery of like whoa there's something unique about israel and why aren't they allowed statues because they've got a temple but there's there's no statue and then you begin to realize it's because we're the image and likeness of god mm -hmm. so we are god's living statues these other you know ancient religions their statues and the prophets throughout the bible always say this they've got ears but they can't hear they've got eyes but they can't see they got mouths but they can't speak it's almost a god bragging oh but my statues my image bearers they can actually hear and they can actually see and they can actually speak and these living statues as they fill the earth the presence of God begins to fill the earth. So again, you know, it's this amazing understanding of what it means to be human, that, that you are a statue of God, right? And, and when people see you, they experience something of the divine, something of God's presence. And we're more than just, you know, statues. We're statues filled with the breath of God. And that's the other part of, of the Genesis story where God breathes into Adam and Eve his breath. So we are statues that have come to life because the spirit is within us. Um, and, and obviously statues right now, big debate, you know, with lots happening of statues being torn down. It's all kicking off here in London. But there's something really significant about what it means to be a statue that points to something very significant. And we are statues that are meant to point the world towards Jesus point to the world as to, as to what our God is like so yeah that's kind of that's what I try and unpack in some of that chapter if we if we really understood what it means to be human I think we we would be amazed at, at what God has fully entrusted to us and how much he deeply loves us it's mm. amazing yeah, you just amazing. encourage people to, to get a copy of the, of the book um, and yeah. it's 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 brilliant because it's kind of like hearted along the way isn't it and mm. you, you the, the stories that you tell are funny and it keeps you kind of keeps you going as, as it were in in what is really good kind of theology oh, as well thank you it's brilliant so thank you there's two questions that are quite similar already um and really it's to do with like people who are new to faith um yeah. what kind of advice would you give them on their journey um and or maybe for people who are sort of on the edge of faith and, and aren't really sure whether to kind of take that that step what advice would you give Yes, a great question. I, I would say remain really curious. So all the questions that feel unanswered, you know, just allow yourself to remain curious about that. Um, Jesus said, seek and you will find. Um, and I think often our doubts and the big questions that we have are invitations into finding Jesus at a deeper level and developing deeper faith. So sometimes people panic about their doubts. Oh, I'm not really sure about dot, dot, dot. But I would say, look, be curious about your doubts and the questions that you have, keep asking them, um, keep exploring. Um, and then, then the other thing I'd say is just get involved. Um, like we're all on a journey. Um, none of us have all the answers. You know, none of us really know fully what we're doing. We're just trying our best to follow Jesus and be obedient um, to his teachings. And, and I think the best thing to do is, is actually get involved and learn as, as you go. Like I love the story of, of the disciples in, in the Gospels because like they're doing all of the stuff of the kingdom, right? They're, they're proclaiming the kingdom. They're healing the sick. You know, they're, you know, operating in deep compassion. And it's only halfway through the story, you know, Jesus gives them an opportunity to, you know, say, like, who do you think I really am? And that's the moment where Peter, you know, you have the confession of faith. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. In other words, 
they were doing all of the stuff before they fully realized you know who jesus was and i think that's deeply encouraging i think there's a huge amount of participation for us before you know we even know fully what we're we're doing so I, i'd encourage people yeah get involved keep coming on a sunday find a place to serve you know all all the opportunities there are to get stuck in um at st bars get stuck in before you have all the answers before you think it's all sorted just get stuck in and and you'll grow as you get stuck in mm. great yeah one of the questions we've got here um asks how do we get excited about the future without knowing what it looks like yeah that's brilliant <laughs> I, I think the more you understand about the character of God, the more we know that the future has to be good because he's in charge of it. So if, if we believe that God is good and that he's loving and that he's generous and he's compassionate and joy finds its source in him and dot, 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 the more we know about the character of God and the fact that he's the same yesterday, today and forevermore, the more we know that the future that he's ordained for us is just incredibly good. And that's, you know, partly what I was mentioning earlier about the story of God, like the end of the story is, is phenomenal. So if, if, if I just sort of like, let's just do a little exercise now, imagining, you know, your pocket of Liverpool, the street you live, live in, mm. just imagine like there's no poverty and there's no violence and there's no crime and there's no hatred or any form of, of racism or any form of, of discrimination and no pain. Just imagine that. Um, and then begin to imagine what would redeemed family life look like and, and redeemed communal life and what would food, you know, what would it taste like, you know, if all of, all of you know, the badness had gone. Um, and I don't know what you're imagining, but Paul says, like, we're praying to one who can do immeasurably more than all we can ever ask for or imagine. So however good it was in your imagination right then, I'm telling you, it's going to be infinitely better than that. Mm. Um, and when you actually recognize that our imagination is a gift from God and we can imagine something really good. And if we can imagine it and he can do immeasurably more, then, then the future is incredibly exciting. Um, and it's a future in which only his purposes come to pass. Um, and therefore, I think we can get excited about that without actually knowing exactly what, what it's going to look like for us. I think we do have to acknowledge the journey ahead for us. There is going to be pain. There is going to be disappointment. There's going to be grief and heartbreak. Um, but we also know that the end of our story is one of complete redemption um and that's why i think we can have great hope i actually think one of the one of the defining features of followers of jesus in this moment is to borrow a phrase from paul is that we do not grieve as those who have no hope so everyone's grieving right now they're grieving loss of work they're grieving financial insecurity um high levels of stress at home and we're grieving that you know we haven't had the premier league and liverpool haven't been able to lift the trophy um there's a huge amount of grief and i can sense the pain even in this <laughs> virtual zoom room um so that everyone's grieving and yet when you know that th there's an end of a story that's glorious and it's guaranteed then we can grieve with deep hope and I think it's one of the markers of followers of Jesus in every stage of history. Whenever there's been grief, they've been able to grieve, but they've grieved with hope because we know that there's a future that's glorious. Mm. That's cool. Um, someone's asking, like, um, practically, what sort of outreach did you do when you started um, KXC? Yeah. I, kind of, I kind of wanted to touch a little bit as well on, um, in the book, there's um, a story of you going to Uganda and the question that you, you kind of learned yeah. about there. And I wonder whether that might, uh, if you could expand yeah. on that and feed into it. Yeah. So, so when we first started, because I mean, I'm guessing St. Mark's is like hundreds and hundreds of years old as a church and therefore as a community. So uh, uh, KXC was like one day old, you know, on day one. So there's no backstory. Um, so we, in terms of like missional activities and ministries, we basically said, we're not going to do anything 
in and of our, ourselves. We are going to partner with others that are doing unbelievable stuff. So we said to all of those that sort of joined our church community in those early months and years, look, there's other churches doing incredible outreach projects. There's other charities doing phenomenal stuff. Our job in these early years is to actually embed ourselves in the community, not to come in with this sense of like, oh, yeah, we know the problems here and we know the solution. It's like, no, 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 we don't. We need to actually build friendships, build trust. We need to understand what are the actual dynamics at work within this community. And then when we've embedded ourselves, we might be able to say, look, we want to be part of the remedy with you as we move forward. So we partnered with a charity called Choices, working with vulnerable families in the area. We partnered with XLP, working with young people at risk of crime and gang activity. We worked with Only Connect, <clears throat> who were working with ex-offenders, people coming out of prison. So we basically, through those partnerships, made some incredible friendships. And then later on in the story, we began to recognize, hang on, there's some gaps where other churches aren't actually able to cover you know, that stuff. So we set up a CAP Center, Christians Against Poverty, helping those in debt um, and other ministries. We started a free occupational therapy clinic for families with kids with additional needs because there wasn't enough provision and NHS waiting lists were you know, crazy long. And so other ministries began to be birthed. So that's how it began. But the, the Uganda story was interesting. I went with actually a load of leaders from New Wine. And we, the task was to go and learn um, about entrepreneurial ministry um, from the church in northern Uganda. So we went to visit the churches and the churches basically, they go into these rural communities. They preach the gospel. People come to faith. That shouldn't surprise us, right? So people come to faith. And before they get immersed in church and dot, 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 they, they get into these groups and they're asked a simple question. What do you have in your hand right now that could alleviate human suffering and create pathways to human flourishing? And the standard answer for a lot of these people who've been living in extreme poverty is nothing. You know, that we live in extreme poverty. We don't have any resources that we could contribute. But they go on this journey of recognizing, actually, they don't need to embrace a victim mindset, that they are made in the image and likeness of God. They are children of God, living statues in the world, and that God has given them gifts and talents and wants to use them as agents in his story to bring healing and redemption to the community so from that very simple question what do you have in your hand all sorts of entrepreneurial things kick off so we met this one guy his initial answer was i've got nothing and then a little bit later he said well look i do own one thing i own a piece of swamp land but the problem with the swamp land is the breeding ground for mosquitoes so malaria rates are really high in this community but that's because of this land that you know i possess so they said to this kind of small group, well, let's try and think entrepreneurially. Let's try and be imaginative. What could we do with the land? And someone in, in the group said, look, what if we try and dig up the swamp land? What if we try and dig deep enough to hit the water level and then we could establish a pond? So people are like, hey, well, let's give it a try, nothing to lose. So they found 20 men that were going to commit to digging the land for 30 days to see if they could hit the water level. And after 30 days, they did. They hit the water level. And this incredible pond emerged and they began to breed some fish in the pond. Um, and with the fish, they began to feed people in the local community. But there were more than enough fish to feed the community. So they started take, to take some of the excess fish to market and generate some income. So with the income, they be, began to fund some of the kids going to school to get an education because education is a key pathway out of poverty. There was more than enough fish just for that. So they began to um, employ a couple of people to manage the pond. They actually built a second and a third pond. Um, and these people employed to manage those two. They generated more fish, more income. They began to build homes in the community. So imagine this land that was previously quite literally killing people in the community became the land that was feeding people, educating the kids, creating employment for people it's actually building homes for people in the community and then they did a bit of research like why are the fish breeding so fast like it just feels crazy and they discovered it was because the fish were breeding on the mosquito feeding sorry on the mosquito larvae so it meant that malaria rates began to plummet 
and this community that was once in extreme poverty through this kind of kingdom entrepreneurial spirit um a whole community was lifted out of poverty um and what was fascinating the start of that story was the gospel you know of someone realizing how god viewed them and if god viewed them like that then they could view themselves differently um and therefore they could live differently and they could contribute and then this simple question what's in your hand so we we came back to london and i said to our whole church i told them the pond story and i said look what have we got in our hand and it kind of revolutionized pretty much everything we did at the church because i think for a lot of church leaders and i'm guessing business leaders and you know whatever sphere you work in we always have this oh if i had more money or if the hall was a bit bigger and if i had an extra few leaders and if dot 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 then i would do xyz mm -hmm. um but what if you didn't think like that what if you thought well here's what we do have here's the hall we do have and here's some of the volunteers we do actually have now if we look at what we have in our hand and just add to it the spirit of God, which is a complete game changer. And then we look at the need in our community. And then when you put those things together, you realize God will always multiply what's in our hand if we offer it to him. And he will always use what's in our hand to extend the kingdom of God in our community. And that, you know, the Exodus story is a great example. Moses had a staff in his hand. That's it. Staff in his hand. You know, and it was the tool of a shepherd at the time. But when you read the Exodus narrative, the journey from Egypt to the promised land, the key moments in the story, it's just a staff. You know, he raises the staff over the waters and the sea parts. He whacks it against a rock and waters begin to flow. You know, so time and time again in the story, you realize this very simple thing that's in Moses's hand. When he offers it to God, God uses it, multiplies it, and it becomes an agent of phenomenal kingdom growth. And therefore, I think as followers of Jesus, we should be asking that question. What do we actually have in our hand? And if we gave it to Jesus and to our local community, I believe God can and will do amazing things through it. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Um, one of the questions we've got here is just asking about how you as a church are facing issues of um, things in in you know the past weeks of of racism and protests and and how we as a church can sort of make a difference in that really yeah yeah it's it's been such a turbulent time and you know in london as i'm guessing in many cities throughout this country there's protesting maybe even rioting and there's a huge amount of pain and i think this is a key moment for the church to be the church and to be a vehicle of of deep reconciliation the gospel is a gospel of reconciliation and as we're reconciled to god we're reconciled to one another and i think the church you know we, there's three things we've been encouraging our people to do but we be trying to do as an organization um number one is recognize number two is repent and number three is replace so number one recognize the the extent of this issue that the systemic racism is present you know in pretty much every part of society in media in politics whether that be anti-semitism or other forms of discrimination um it's present in our education systems and and it's present in the church you know and let's get closer to home it's present in the church of england and it was actually deeply moving the Archbishop of Canterbury at General Synod just before we went into lockdown um, in February, addressed General Synod and said the Church of England is systemically racist and I'm ashamed of that and I repent of some words to that effect. And I think I think every church has to acknowledge that in our backstory, um, we've been part of the problem. Yes, we long to be part of the remedy and part of the healing, but we've actually created a huge amount of pain. So I think as a leader of this church in London, I've had to stand up and say, look, I, I want to recognize that this isn't just an issue over in America. This is an issue in our communities. And it's not just an issue in the broader church. It's an issue in our church. And if we can't recognize that, it's very much harder to journey towards healing. So there's the recognition. Secondly, there's the repentance thing. 
which is is saying we are deeply deeply sorry um it involves asking for forgiveness but as i mentioned earlier repentance means turning around it means turning towards um and alter ultimately means turning towards jesus and the future we've spoken a lot about that the future that's ahead of us and the future that is ahead of us revelation 7 verse 9 is that every tribe and tongue will be gathered in this unbelievable moment of worship around the lamb that was slain so if that's the story we're living towards and our lives are shaped by the end we live for then we need to turn ourselves towards that glorious future so that's recognize repent and then finally replace what what are new patterns of thinking that we need to engage in what are new practices what are new cultures that we need to embrace within our church community that create genuine home a genuine sense of belonging um, i want people to walk into kxc um, and think wow this is like nothing i've experienced here on earth in other words this is a little foretaste of heaven like this is such diversity, ethnic diversity, diversity in terms of demographics, you know, socially diverse. Now we're not there yet. I mean, I don't know your, your community, but at Kexi, we've got a long, long way to go, but I want to journey towards that future because I want people to taste a little foretaste of heaven, which I think is what the church is, is called to be. So I think that's the simple framework we've been using, recognize, repent, replace, and I've been doing that personally, and we've been trying to do it corporately as a church. And I think this is, this is a moment where I, I think this is a phenomenal opportunity for the church to proclaim a message that will bring healing. You know, I think there's a strong, you know, secular drive um, um, and pathway through this. But I think there's a kingdom story around reconciliation, around repentance and around healing that I don't think the secular narrative offers that. And I think the only way we can be the church of the world is, is if we actually proclaim our story. So one thing I've been saying or reflecting on really is, is you know, that revelation passage, every tribe and time gathered around the lamb that was slain, the equivalent in, in the secular mindset, which dominates our culture today is they want every tribe and tongue gathered. They just don't want the lamb that was slain present. So they want all of the kingdom and all of the benefits of the kingdom. They just don't want Jesus to be the king. Um, so they want to drive towards this end that we've been talking about without Jesus. And yet it's the gospel message that the end of the story is only possible because Jesus lived and died and rose again. So any of us trying to get towards this end goal without proclaiming Jesus is the pathway to the end goal. I think we're failing the culture by not actually saying the way to break these dividing walls of hostility is, 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 in, is in Christ because he lived, he died for our sins and he rose to new life. Um, and in his resurrection, there's an opportunity for something entirely new that belongs to the kingdom of God. So those are some of the reflections that, yeah, I've been having. I think that's a really good question to end on. To be mm. honest, I think that that was that was brilliant. Thank you. And um, can, can we uh, like can we unmute people and maybe do a bit of a thank you? Is that all right? Like a, it might be a bit random, but a bit of a clap, true clap. <laughs> they were random. We... <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for joining us and and coming and and sharing loads of wisdom and and there's plenty Great. there for us to take away for for sure. So thank you so much. You. Absolute pleasure. I've been, I've been going through on my iPad, seeing all the different faces. So, so <laughs> lovely to be with you. Um, and, and maybe we'll connect again, maybe at a new wine festival or, or maybe up in Liverpool, who knows. But um, lovely to meet you all virtually. Huge God bless. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.